Okay, we're going to continue with Job. We're going to start with chapter 4, verse 1. Then Eliphaz, the Tendamite, answered and said, so this is Eliphaz talking to Job. He's going to, tell, he's going to tell Job what he really fears back from chapter 3. Remember that Timonites were known for their great wisdom. And so we're going to see this great wisdom that he's going to give. And remember, this is going to be worldly wisdom. As I done showed you that these three friends of Job are lost. And they're not born again Christians. They're lost, they're lost men. So remember that as we read. Verse 2. If we essay to commune with thee, wilt thou be grieved? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Eliphaz believes that it's up to him to defend God. He's thinking that somebody has to set Job straight. He totally thinks that Job is on the wrong track, as I said before. And that Job is uh, going through all this because he's wicked. And he's going to set Job straight. At least that's what he, he thinks he's going to do. In verse 3, 4, and 5, Behold, thou hast instructed many, and thou hast strengthened the weak hands. Thy words have upholded him that was fallen, and thou hast strengthened the feeble knees. But now it is come unto thee, and thou faintest. It touches thee, and thou art troubled. Eliphaz tells him, You helped many people with their problems. You helped make them strong in the Lord. But now these trials and tests have come your way, and you've lost it. And he's calling them a hypocrite. You tell others to be strong, but yet you're not when it comes to you. It's kind of sounds, it kind of sounds like what they told Jesus in Matthew 27, 42. They told Jesus he saved others. Himself he cannot save. Well, Job, is, Job knows he's done nothing wrong. He's telling Job that the reason he followed God was that none of these trials would come upon him. Like I said, this is Eliphaz telling Job why, he's, why he has fear. It's kind of like the devil. You know, we know why we do things. We know where our heart is. But the devil is always trying to put something else in us. Like, uh, well, you only did that because whatever. There's many excuse, excuses that the devil gives us on why we do things. When Christians, uh, born-again Christians, when they do things, good deeds, it's from the heart. And it's in secret. But the devil will put it on them all. You did it so you'd be... You did it so people can see your good works. But anyway, these are lies, just like here. Verse 6. Is not this thy fear, thy confidence, thy hope in the uprightness of thy ways? He tells Job, this is your fear. You were afraid of not being strong in the spirit when things happened to you. You didn't know if you would be able to be that Christian. So this is why you, you have fear. Because you didn't think you'd be able to go through it. Job said back in verses 25 and 26. He said he was afraid that even though he lived a Christian life. He still had to go through these trials. Not that he wasn't going to be strong enough. When they came. He didn't say anything not being strong enough. And not being able to go through them. He just had the fear that he still might have to go through them. Just like I said. It rains on the just and the unjust. I mean there's. I mean. I know it's going to rain on me, but uh, I, I'm like, I hope the rain ain't very much if it does rain on me. But if it does rain on me very much, well then, you know, I pray to God that I'm going to stand like he tells me to stand. On his word, on his promises. And this is the same place Job was at. <clears throat> Excuse me. But his friend here is trying to tell him otherwise. In verse 7, it says, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished for being innocent. Or where were the righteous cut off? So the question is, is, do the righteous die? And yes, they do. But we're not talking about salvation. Their bodies die, but not their soul and their spirit. There are many in the Bible that were this way. Abel, a righteous man, was killed by his brother. And he was a righteous man. He did nothing wrong. He was righteous. Stephen's a disciple of God was preaching about Jesus and was stoned so there's men out there who are righteous 
and they are being killed. So the answer to this, who, will, who, who, who dies from being innocent? Well, there's many. There's many in the Bible. But he makes it sound like only, only the wicked perish. And we see that's not so. Do, Christians, do the Christian people ever lose out at the end? Are they ever cut off? No, they're not. And we know that. Christians have an everlasting life with the Lord in the new heavens and the new earth. That's what we look forward to. The Lord has told us these things. So there's no cutoff point for the Christian. But what he's saying, Job, if you were innocent, these things wouldn't be happening to you. Verse 8. Even as I have seen, they that plow iniquity and sow wickedness weep the same. He's telling Job, you weep what you sow. Like I said before, this is really... Uh, philosophy of thinking from from uh, Eliphaz they always have a different view of the way the Lord looks at it now you do weep what you sow and that is biblical he is going to weep what he sows but it's not going to be until the end of the, the book and we'll get to that but for right now this, this uh, Eliphaz this friend of his is doing nothing but blaming him blaming Job for what's going on verse 9 through 11 by the blast of God they perish and by the breath of his nostrils are they consumed the roaring of the lion and the voice of the fierce lion and the teeth of the young lions are broken the old lion perish for lack of prey and the strout lion whelps are scattered abroad Eliphaz is saying those who are wicked sooner or later sooner or later young or old will get what they deserve. That's what he's saying here. So Job, you're just weeping what you sow. That's what he's telling them. Is this what you tell someone when they've just lost everything, especially their ten children? Is this is the way you talk to someone who just lost their family? We, I mean, I don't even think we really have to, the verses that I've given to show you that these men are lost, I don't even, I don't even have to give them to you because just reading this, you can tell this is not a Christian man. He's like kicking Job while he's down. I mean, just read the verses. Verse 12. Now a thing was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a little thereof. When he said it was brought to him in secret, right there, that, that ought to tell you right there, this is not from the Lord. Because the Lord doesn't have secrets among his people. He don't tell me one thing and tell someone else something else. There's no secrets. Between. So you, we're going we're gonna to hear what this man says. Verse 13. <clears throat> and thoughts from the vision of the night, when deep sleep fallen on men, fear came upon me, and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Again, this is another reason uh, this is not a Christian man, and he did not get something from the Lord, a vision from the Lord. Because in the Bible, when you, you read the Bible, whenever an angel appeared to a man, and sometimes that angel was Jesus, but whenever that happened, the angel or Jesus would tell them, fear not. I mean, we would do the same today. If if Jesus was to come and stand before us in the spirit, but we could see him, that would still scare us. Even though we know it's Jesus, it would still scare us to see it, uh, a form of the spirit in front of us. Well, that's what they did back here. Fear. They got feared. And the angel would always tell them, fear not. But that's not what it says here. It says fear came upon him and he trembled. And he shook in his bones. But he didn't say anything about the angel telling him, fear not. We need to read the scriptures. That's why we need to read the Bible to understand the way the, the Lord works. Verse 15 and 16. Then a spirit passed before my face. And the hairs, the hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was not before my eyes. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, now he's going to tell Job about his vision he had. When you don't want people to question you on whatever you may want to do, you tell them the Lord told you. The Lord showed me in a dream or the Lord told me. When you do that, it really uh, stop, it stops people from saying, oh no, that, that's, not what, that's not what the Lord showed you. Because we, we can't question that. If they said the Lord did it, then we need to believe it. I mean, it's, If they said the Lord told them, then we should not question it. 
unless it's something that goes against the word of God. Like if we have a, a wife and she says the Lord told her to go on a mission. She has she's she's married. She has a family, kids, but she she tells her husband the Lord has shown me that I need to go on this mission trip. Well, that's against the word of God. Now there's some of you who might not agree with me on this, but like I said, read the Bible, the whole Bible. See how God works. For women, the place for the woman is to take care of her husband and her children and her house. The Bible plainly says, teaches that. She's, the Lord has always had a man over a woman, protecting her and taking care of her. So this is not the will of God that a woman, a mother and a wife, leave her family. But there's women out there who would say that just so nobody will question them and say, and say oh, no, I don't think so. You didn't hear that from the Lord. Now, I would. I would. Why? Because I'm special? No. There's nothing special about me. But I have read the Bible. I do study the Bible. And I see that the Lord has always had the woman with the man, taking care of the man and, his, and her children. Always. Be careful when people tell you, well, the Lord told me to do this. Uh, many times, I'm sure it's true. But there's times when it's not true. They just say that so they can get away with it. Verse 17. Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Is he trying to show Job that God is just punishing him for his weaknesses? It says Job was an innocent man. The latter fast is saying you are guilty because God can't be wrong. In verse 18. Behold, he put no trust in his servants, and his angels he charged with folly. And he's lying here again, his servants, which are us. God has put his trust in us. Not his complete trust, because we're still man. We are man, and we're going to fail. But he has entrusted the prophets to tell the people, to give a word to the people from him. He's trusted us, born-again Christians, with the ministry of reconciliation. He's trusted us to go and tell people about him. So he does trust his servants to a point. Because like I said, we're still, we're still going to fail God because we're in these sin, sinful bodies yet. As far as his angels, yeah, he, he had a third of the angels kicked out of heaven for wanting to follow Satan. So that's a true statement. That is a true, a true statement there. Verse 19. How much less in them that dwell in houses of clay whose foundation is in the dust, which are crushed before the moth. He's saying if God couldn't trust the angels, how is he going to trust man? Well, our house is going to die. These, this shell that we live in, it is, it is dying. But our soul and our spirit isn't. He's saying because this house we live in is dying, that's why we're going to fail God. Well, no, it's not the house. It's not the shell itself that pleases the Lord. It's our soul and our spirit that's inside these shells that please the Lord. And we are not, and we are not going to perish. We will not be crushed. Verse 20 and 21. They are destroyed from morning to evening. They perish forever without any regarding it. Doeth not their excellency which is in them go away. They die even without wisdom. He's saying that people like Job don't make it. They seem to live a Christian life, but when they die, it's all for nothing. No one remembers them. They stood for nothing. It meant their life was, was meaningless. Their house is destroyed, and they die without knowing anything. That's what he's saying here in these verses. This is not a man of God. You do not talk to a man who just lost his children this way. Chapter 5, verse 1. Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? He's saying, if you're right with God, he will get you out of this. Call on him, and he'll get you out. Which, it's true, but sometimes it isn't. If we look at Paul in the New Testament, Paul was, was right with God once he got born again. But Paul spent a lot of time in prison. A lot of time. Did he get him out? No. The Lord wanted him in there. At the time, Paul didn't know why, but Paul wrote letters while in prison. And now those letters are being read today. You think Paul knew that? He didn't know that. 
but that was God's will for him to be in there to write those letters. So sometimes he doesn't get us out of things that seem to be bad. But then there's times he does because we can look at Peter. Peter was thrown into prison and the Lord got him out. He didn't have to stay in prison. The Lord did get him out. So he can, but sometimes he doesn't. I'm sure that at the time, Paul and Peter was doing the will of God. They were both doing the will of God and both of them had a different uh, route to take. Job didn't know, Paul didn't know, but God knew why they were, why he was having them go through this. You see, God does have 2020 vision. He does know. We might not know, but he does. Which saint are you going to call now? That's what he says. Which of the saints will thou turn to? Well, we're going to see that in the Bible, no one, no one ever prayed to any saint. They didn't do it. It doesn't show that in the Bible. In fact, the Ten Commandments say not to do it. The Third Commandment says, Thou shalt, not ha thou shalt have no other gods before me. So there isn't no one else we should be praying to. We should have no other gods before our God. He is the only God. The Fifth Commandment says, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them. So this is strictly uh, against God's will that we pray to any anyone or any God with a small g there's only one god to pray to and that's our lord jesus jehovah so read the verses read these verses as we're reading look what look what the verses are saying now we can get confused because many times the verses he's 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 telling job are true but not for this situation they're true but not in this situation remember that when you're reading remember that Verses through two through five, for wrath, for wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly, I crushed his inhabitation. His children are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them, whose harvest the hungry eateth up. And taketh it even out of the thorns. And the robber swallows up their substance. What he's saying here is, is God is good to the good. And Job wasn't one of them. Now this, this uh, there's many people who believe this. If you're, if you're not good, if you're not being treated good by God, it's because you haven't been good. I've showed you before, even, even wicked people, God is good to. We're able to see by the scriptures that this isn't so. Luke 6.35 says, Love your enemies and do good, and then hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and you shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Okay, uh, I need to make a point here since we're reading this verse. While we're on this verse, I just want to show you. When you lend money, the Lord says, Do it like you're not going to get it in return. Do it as like you're just giving it to them and you're not lending to them, lending it to them. Because if you do it that way, the Lord says, your reward will be great. That's what it says right here. It'll be greatly received either now, while we're here on earth, or in heaven. He's going to reward us either here or there. But we will get a reward for lending money and not expecting anything in return. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, Verses 13 through 15, it speaks about your riches, your money, and how it can hurt you. Meaning, getting <clears throat> blessings on what the Lord has given you to use. So, you know, you receive blessings when the Lord gives you money. He expects you to use the money He gives you. Just like the men with the three talents. The Lord was very displeased with the one who took his talent and saved it. When the Lord gives you, gives us, He wants us to use it to help others. Money is put into risky investment, investments that turn bad, and everything is lost just about. Yeah, there's some who make money, but there's been a lot of people who've lost money. And in the end, those who have lost, they have nothing to leave their children, their grandchildren. So you want to invest your money? 
done invested in the stock market where you're taking a chance. God said to invest it in helping people. And if you invest it in helping people, you will. He didn't say might. He said you will get a return. See, I, what money the Lord lets me have, if I'm, if I'm going to invest it, I'm in invested in helping people. Because he says I will get a return on that. It's not why I do it. Remember, it's not. It's, this is not the reason we do it. But he says this is what's going to happen. So those of you who have money in the stock market are using your money to make more money. It's not biblical. It's not the will of God. These are the scriptures. I've just read them to you. Read them for yourself. You own investments. You won't reward on your money. Help people. Okay, I just threw that in there. Back to the verse, though. The reason we came to this verse. The last part of the verse says... For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. In Romans 2, 4, God says he's kind and good and patient with the lost. And it is intended to turn them from their sin, sinful ways to the Lord. That's why he's good and kind to them. See, this guy here is totally preaching something totally different. But the word of God says God is good to the, to the wicked. Also in Second Peter 3, 9, it says God is being patient for our sake. That's why he hasn't returned. Giving us time to get saved. Before the time of destruction comes. If God didn't do this. If God wasn't good to the lost. Then why would we turn to him? God shows us how good he is. To the lost people. He shows how good he is. And that's why people turn to him. But these guy, this guy right here is preaching totally something different. Verse 6. Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust neither doeth trouble spring out of the ground yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward everything he just said is is what's happened to Job he's saying that the troubles don't come out of nowhere we make them happen and it's a true statement but like I said it is a true statement but not in this case because we are born with a sin nature we're, we're born in a sin nature we're, we're born to sin just like when you're a baby, you know, most babies, the first word they learn is mine. That's the first learn word they start saying is mine. And our troubles, all they do, when it says right here, as the sparks fly upward, our troubles, they arise naturally. They flare up naturally. I mean, well, that's the way we start saying mine, but then it gets, gets worse and worse. Then we start to still lie, whatever it may be. He's just constantly blaming Job for his troubles here. This man's view of God is totally wrong. He's making God out to be judgmental, condemning that he is a God of wrath. We saw God, and we know he's powerful. And we know he's going to be judgmental and as for on judgment day. And, he's going to, and he does condemn. And, he, and we will see his wrath. But again, I have to say, not here. He's shown, all, he's shown Job all this. But what he's not showing Job is the love of God. That's no, he's not showing the love of God to Job. This is When you have a man who is down, this is what you do. You show them the love of God. You don't kick them while they're down. Verse 8. I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. Now remember, Eliphaz is uh, from a, a nation known for their wisdom. And so right now, right here in verse 8, is when he's going to start showing, hey, look, what this is my wisdom. This is what I would do. I would seek God. And unto God would I commit my cause. And, and really, he really is boasting here. Verses 9, 10, and 11. Which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. Who giveth rain upon the earth and sendeth the waters upon the fields. To set up on high those that be low. That those which mourn may be exalted to safety. Now, now if he would have said these three verses at the very beginning and just and just and didn't just kept quiet after that, then this definitely would have been the Christian thing to do. Because these three verses are are right with God. These can help a man who's hurting, because the Lord is always doing miracles, and He does take care of the earth, and He lifts those who are down and sad. And he protects them. So these three verses, this is what a Christian man would do. Tell someone who is down. But as we see, 
Eliphaz had a lot more before this to say, and he still has a lot after this to say. Verse 12, he disappointed the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. And this is true if we look at it eternally. But looking at it as temporal is not true because we can look at Hitler. He devised the, all kind of stuff to kill the Jews, and he did. So temporal, God didn't disappoint them. But if we look at eternal way, it, it, with our eternal eyes, what we do know, yes, at the end, all these devices of the, will not make it. The craftiness of men will not make it. God will overcome. He will be the victor at the end. So this verse is true, but it's also not true. It's true as far as we look at it eternally, but for temporary basis, no. Men are getting away with this. Verse 13. He taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the forward is carried headlong. These are men who think they're too smart for God. And we know what God says about men's wisdom. To God, they're foolish. You can take the most intelligent man, a man that you think has great wisdom, and to God, he's foolish. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to throw a name out here, and that's I'll use him as an example, Dr. Phil. On TV, his program, people think he has, he has great counsel for all these people who have their problems. But if you listen to him, he has never pointed to the scriptures and he's never pointed to the Lord for these problems. And because of that, he is given counsel that is ungodly. Because godly counsel will point you to the scriptures. It will point you to the Lord. Okay, Verses 14 through 20. They meet with darkness in the daytime. They grope in the noonday as in the night. But he saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor hath hope, and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore despise not thou chastening of the Almighty. For he maketh sore, and he bindeth up. He woundeth and his hands make whole. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. In phantom he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. Again, these verses are true, but not always. He can do these things. He can do them. He can take care of us, and he does correct us. And he has. All we have to do is read the word of God, and see that all the disciples died a horrible death, except for John, the disciple. But his other disciples, they all died a, a, a horrible death. Uh, John the Baptist, look how he, they killed, they beheaded him. And who was he? A man of God. So if we see Christians suffering, or even die a horrible death, that doesn't mean he wasn't walking with the Lord. Doesn't mean he wasn't walking with the Lord. We might look at it that way with these eyes, if we look at it with these physical eyes, but many men of God were killed a horrible death, but they were right with the Lord. God is not always good to the righteous. Sometimes the righteous uh, go through trials, tribulations that are that we see seem to be hard. Okay, just like Stephen's when they were stoning him to death. Now I believe this. I believe this. It says that he was praising God. I believe. That even though they were stoning him to death, Stephen was such in the spirit, so in the spirit, that he didn't even feel those stones. He was killed, but he didn't even feel those stones because he was so filled with the spirit. I, 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 that's what I believe. Just like Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, when they wouldn't worship the calf, the golden calf, and uh, they were thrown into the furnace. Well, these men were ready be burned to death for believing in God, for living for the Lord. They're ready. They were ready to be burnt to death. They didn't know the Lord was gonna was gonna uh, save them from it, but they were ready to go. And just like us, we need to be ready. If the Lord, if we see uh, something coming along that's that's gonna hurt us, maybe even kill us, and the time is coming when when that will happen, tribulation. If you're a believer. And you don't take the mark of the beast, you're going to be beheaded. So, are are 
is our Christian walk strong enough to go through this? Now, that is a question for you and for me. Is our Christian walk strong enough that we can go through this? Just like Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. They were. I mean, they walked into the furnace. Well, they weren't walked into the furnace. They were thrown into the furnace. The men who threw them in were burnt and killed. But they themselves were ready to die for the Lord. Are you, are we ready to die for the Lord? I mean, uh, there's a time coming where it's here now. In other, in other countries, it's already here. They are they're they're killing Christians in other countries for for being open of, of of their belief. So remember this. But whether he does or not, we should say, God, <coughs> I'm yours. Live or die, I'm yours. Verse twenty one. Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. At the destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the breast of the beast of the earth, for thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt not sin. Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great. And thy offspring as the grass of the earth. <clears throat> thou shalt come to thy grave in a full age, like as a stalk of corn cometh in the season. What he's saying here is that, Job, if you repent and shape up, you'll live a long time. This is not true. He's saying good things here, and they do sound good, but no, being a Christian doesn't mean you're going to have a long life. I've known Christians, young Christians, who have died and gone to be with the Lord. So even though this sounds good, we gotta read it. Does it does it align with the Word of God? Because there's many people out there, men of philosophy and thing. They 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 make things sound good, but does it align with what God says? That's what we need to be careful of. We need to hear what they're saying, and then we remember what God has told us in His Word. In verse 27, lo, this we have searched it, so it is. Hear it and know, thou. For thy good. All these verses are true, but not being used the way the Lord meant. He's saying right here, hey, we know it, we've searched it, we know this is good counsel, but they're just using it the wrong way. For example, say someone just died in your family, a Christian. Well, are you going to go up to that Christian who just lost whoever in the family and say, hallelujah, praise God, he's in heaven with the Lord. Even though those what he said is true, but this is not the time to say it. You don't go to someone who just lost someone and say, praise God. Even though it's, it's it, yes, we need to praise God because our loved one is no longer hurting or whatever it is. They're with the Lord now. We're still here in this stinky earth, but they're with the Lord. But this is not the, go up, the time to go up to this person and tell them, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Your, your, your friend or your family is in heaven. Do you see what I'm talking about? These verses, of, many of the verses they use are true verses, but there's a time to use them. And these verses were all taken pretty much out of context. They're blaming Job for doing something he didn't do. They're blaming him for being a wicked man, and that's why all this is coming on. These verses are for those who need correction. That's what it says. In Job's case, again, this is not him. Job does not need correction from the Lord. It sounds good, but it's not true. Anyone who's a born-again Christian, we know we go through trials. We know we go through tribulations. We know it's going to rain on us. But we do make it through whatever it is because God goes through it with us. He is there with us. People don't, who don't have the Lord, they end up, like I said, either drug addicts, alcoholics, they go into a depression, or they might even commit suicide. But that's when you go through it without the Lord. We have the Lord. Verse 27, his friends is saying, We have studied this to be true, and this, to the, this is the way it is. Listen to our counsel, because it is for your own good. Now this is what his, his friend is saying. Listen to me, because this is good counsel. But in Psalms 1, 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. If you want to know if someone is ungodly, 
when they're counseling you and they don't ever point you to Jesus or to the scriptures, if they don't point you in that direction, then it's their own worldly counsel that they're giving to you. It's the counsel of men. It's the counsel of the ungodly. Mm -hmm. 